right then settle down so <coughs> we'll get inducted into uh, basics of ellipse we had we had a stint with parabola and then a stint with quadratics which was so intimately related to parabolas and now we would venture into uh, the next unit of coordinate geometry by this time I'm almost assuming that you've matured to a certain degree and you've begun to get a feel for coordinate geometry because it's the same field that will get extended the same set of ideas with a little bit of modification here and there that would get applied to the last two units of coordinate geometry which is ellipse and hyperbola by the time we are done with ellipse I'm very confident that you know you would have you would be in full control of things uh, if you've been following the instructions and you've been doing these sheets uh, religiously. Now, <coughs> so again, the moment we got started with the uh, conic sections, we hopped on two important things, hopped on two important things, a fixed point referred to as the focus. right and a fixed line not passing through s that fixed line that i'm going to talk about will not pass through s a fixed line not passing through s such that this point and this fixed line l are in the same plane they have to be in the same plane right they would obviously always be in the same plane if you have a fixed point and a fixed line you can always find a unique plane passing through this point and this fixed line so it's redundant to say that they have to be in the same plane but i talk of a third entity which is a moving entity a point p which must move in the plane determined by the focus and the fixed line fixed line like you already know is referred to as the directrix So, in the plane determined by the focus and the directrix, we are seeking to examine a moving point in the plane. Let that point be P. Let that point be P. Now, the it moves not arbitrarily. It moves subject to a condition. The condition is that the ratio of its distances from the fixed point to the fixed line is a constant. The constant is referred to as the eccentricity of the conic. SP by PM, that's the condition for the movement of the fixed point. This ratio referred to as E, the eccentricity of the conic section. E would be a fundamental property of the path described by the point P, right? E equal to 1 was a parabola. This time we would examine E lying between 0 and 1. When the eccentricity lies between 0 and 1, then the nature of the path described by the point P is referred to as an ellipse. Then the conic section would be referred to as an ellipse right uh, no because of this fundamental property across all ellipse there is there are a bunch of common properties enjoyed you know because they they seem to be differing only in the value of e right uh, again we're going to talk of an axis of symmetry. Every conic section is symmetric about an axis, which is called the axis of the conic. And that axis, like we've defined earlier, is a line passing through the focus and perpendicular to the directrix. That's the axis of the conic section. Passing through the focus and perpendicular to the directrix is the axis of the conic section. right <coughs> now I need to 
I need to give the the path of form algebraic form right now in order that I could give it an algebraic form I would need to define my coordinate axis I would need to define the origin of coordinates based on that we would have to give an algebraic look to the path described by P subject to this condition yes or no right first of all on the axis on the axis the on its during its journey the point P passes a certain point on the axis while the point P describes a path commensurate with this condition it passes through a certain point A on the axis it passes through a certain point A on the axis and that point would be referred to as the vertex of the conic section that point would be referred to as the vertex of the conic section so that point is A and let's say this is Z then AS by AZ will also be equal to E that means A divides S Z in the ratio E is to 1 E is to 1 S A is to A Z is E is to 1 <coughs> E times A Z right where E is an instance of the point P isn't it distance of A from S to Z is equal to E S A by A Z is E therefore A must be an instance of P A must be an instance of P the path traced by the point describing an ellipse clear now uh, not only a i could have chosen another point say a prime on the axis i could have chosen another point a prime on the axis such that s a prime distance of s from this point a prime is e times a prime z distance of a prime from the directrix that means s a prime divided by a prime z is he a point could have been chosen on this side of the focus says that s a prime by a prime z is also a number equal to e could i have done that yes or no so there is yet another point on the axis of the conic section through which the point p passes and therefore this point a prime also lies on the ellipse therefore there are two vertices of the ellipse a and a prime these are two vertices of the ellipse a and a prime right very clearly <coughs> if the point p passes through this point a hmm, then it couldn't have passed through another point to the right of a the ellipse couldn't have passed through because if you move to the right of a the ratio e will be disturbed right then as by az for a point here will no longer be e it will be greater than e isn't it if i select a point a here then its distance from the focus s is increasing its distance from z is decreasing ratio is increasing therefore no part of the ellipse will lie to the right of a no part of the ellipse will lie to the right of a that means this is the rightmost extremity extremity of the ellipse this is the rightmost extremity of the ellipse yes or no similarly can you have a point to the left of a prime you cannot have a point to the left of a prime on the ellipse because again it will disturb the ratio it will no longer be maintained e that means this is the leftmost extremity of the ellipse this is the leftmost extremity of the ellipse right this is a point on the axis closest to the this directrix this is a point on the axis farthest from the di directrix these are the two extremes within which the ellipse is confined yes or no this length a a prime again is referred to as the major axis of the ellipse and a property of the ellipse this length a a prime is a property and is referred to as the major axis of the ellipse this length is referred to as the major axis of the ellipse Increasing. So, consciously, 
No, can you actually have the same ratio? Can you have two points to the left of S dis dividing this in the same ratio? It won't be the same ratio, isn't it? It can't be the same ratio E that we are talking of, isn't it? So, <coughs> this length A A prime within which the ellipse is confined is referred to as the major axis of the ellipse and is commonly designated by 2A. 2A. The length A A prime is designated as 2 times a real number A, positive real number A. Clear? Hmm? Now, what we do is, let me choose the x axis aligned with the major axis. There is no loss of generality if I did that. Let me choose the x axis of the ellipse aligned with the, uh, let me choose the major axis aligned with the x axis or rather the x axis aligned with the axis of the ellipse. Therefore, let this be the choice of our x axis. Let this be the choice of our x axis the axis of the ellipse as the x axis right next we need the origin what we do is midpoint of a a prime let me choose midpoint of a a prime let me choose as the origin of coordinates right so c c is the midpoint of a a prime Let that be our choice of origin. This is our choice of origin. Does it make sense? Let this be our choice of origin. And if this is the origin, then a line passing through C and perpendicular to the x-axis will be the y-axis. That will be the y-axis. Yes or no? Right. this will be the y axis <coughs> right now now <coughs> since c is the midpoint of a a prime c a will be equal to c a prime each will be equal to a since the entire length a, a prime is 2a right c divides a a prime equally small a and small a right so C A prime is C A is equal to A, right? A and A prime are points on the x-axis by, by the choice we've made, because of the choice we've made. Then the coordinates of A will be A0, coordinates of A prime will be minus A0 precisely, right? Next, I want to know the coordinates of S, the focus. That means, if I know CS, then I would know the coordinates of S. S would then be CS, 0. CS, 0 is going to be S. Clear? So then, I also want to know the coordinates of Z. Now, the directrix in this case is parallel to the y-axis. In fact, the y-axis was chosen parallel to the directrix. Right? So this would be x equal to a constant. I want to also determine that constant. So if I can know the, if I can figure out the coordinates of z, then the x coordinate of z would turn out to be something and this line would be x equal to that number, would be x equal to that number, right? Hmm? Right. Now, these are our two equations and my first objective is to figure out the coordinates of the focus in terms of a and e and the equation of the directrix that means coordinates of z in terms of a and e clear so what i do here is all these distances i want to write in terms of how far they are from c in terms of c because c is the origin so it makes great sense to write everything in terms of c right isn't it so this one s a S A is actually C A minus C S. S A is C A minus C S is E times A Z. A Z is this, which is 
CZ minus CA. CZ minus CA. Yes or no? AZ. AZ is this, which is CZ minus CA. What's the problem? I need AZ, right? AZ would be this length, which is CZ minus CA. Is there an issue? Oh, SA is CA minus CS. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that was a typo. Yes. SA, which is CA minus CS. I'm so sorry about that. CA minus CS. Right. This equation, SA prime. SA prime is this, which is CA prime plus CS. Yes or no? CA prime plus CS. That's SA prime. CA prime plus CS. That's equal to E times A prime Z. A prime Z is CA prime plus CZ. Is that okay or not? Huh? Huh? See, C is the midpoint of A prime. So if you take any point to the right of the midpoint, it will be closer to A compared to A prime, isn't it? In any case, the equations will reveal that. Although, you know, it's it's ordinary geometry by means of which you can figure out that it has to be closer. But we'll, we'll see that very shortly. I mean, your contention, I understand, is the following. Whether S is going to be to the right of C or S is going to be the left of C. Right? That's your contention. We'll figure out in a short while. Right? Because then this would be rendered algebraic irrespective of where it is. Suppose this was to the left of C then this CS would turn out to be a negative number, isn't it? It will turn out to be positive. So, if I assume one thing or the other, there would still be no loss of generality. Consistency here would prevail. Got me? Hmm? Now, <coughs> see, C prime, C A prime and C are equal. Isn't it? Because C is the midpoint of A prime, C A prime and C A are equal. So, can I replace the CA prime wherever it appears by CA? Right? So, re let me remove the prime. CA prime is the same as CA. So, these two equations are entirely in terms of CA, CS, CZ. CA, CS, CZ. 3 adapted from 1, 4 adapted from 2. Right? Yes or no? <coughs> yes, please. Is that okay? Hmm? Now, now, if I add these two equations, if I add these two equations, what do I get? 2CA is 2ECZ. Yes or no? Yes, if I add 3 and 4, then we get 2CA is 2E CZ. Right? That makes CZ is CA by E. But CA is small a. So this turns out to be A by E. That means Z. Since CZ is A by E, the coordinates of Z will be A by E comma 0. What would be the equation of the directrix? X equal to A by E. The equation of the directrix then turns out to be X equal to A by E. Right? On doing a 3 plus 4. On doing a 3 plus 4. This is what transpires. Right? Hmm? Next. Wipe this off. Make room for more. Now, 
now if I do like a 4 minus 3 minus 3 then I get 2 C S is 2 E C A 2 E C A which means C S is E into C A but C A is A so that makes it A E Dekho. C S is A E E is a number less than 1 so C S would be less than E C S turns out to be uh, would be less than A and since it is positive it must be to the right of C since it is positive it must be to the right of C if C S had turned out to be negative then S would have been to the right so C S is A E which is clearly less than A so, so far so good, right? Coordinates of S then would be AE0. Coordinates of S would then be AE, 0. Yes or no? Hmm? Right, Shashi? Now, can I just remove the clutter and retain only things that are important? Can I wipe this off for a moment? <clears throat> so with the axis of the ellipse as the x axis, <coughs> see the midpoint of the line joining the two vertices of the ellipse A and A prime. <coughs> the focus S being A E 0, 2 A is the major axis of the ellipse. A is called the semi major axis. 2A is the major axis. A is referred to as the semi major axis. E is the eccentricity, a number lying between 0 and 1. <coughs> this is the directrix for the choice of coordinate system this would be x equal to a by e this would be x equal to a by e right the fixed point and the directrix now are known in terms of the frame of reference that we have chosen right <coughs> this is the moving point p whose coordinates are x comma y now in our choice of coordinate system where this is the major axis is also the axis x the major axis is also the x axis midpoint of the line joining the two vertices is the origin of coordinates the center c and this would be the y axis which is parallel to the directrix right then from definition sp will be equal to e times pm e is the eccentricity sp would be e times pm for any xy lying on the ellipse right sp then would be e times pm or sp squared would be e squared into pm squared sp squared distance formula x minus a e whole squared plus y squared is e squared now what is pm realize that pm this length is a by e minus x this is a by e minus x yes or no see this point and this point they have the same y coordinate right the x of this is x the x of this is a by e so the difference between the x of m and x of p is a by e minus x a by e minus x right this length is a by e minus x so e squared into a by e minus x whole square right This is like a A minus E x whole square. 
this is like a right i allow this e to penetrate so a minus e x once it goes in it will become e e squared would become e when it goes in so a minus e x whole square right and now this x square and this x square i consolidate in one single position so 1 minus e squared into x squared plus y squared is a squared into 1 minus e squared see if it makes sense to you right hmm? I divide by a squared into 1 minus e squared both sides I divide both sides by a squared into 1 minus e squared so I end up getting x squared by a squared plus y squared by a squared into 1 minus e squared equal to 1 true for all x y lying on the ellipse true for all x y lying on the ellipse right where this number a squared into 1 minus e squared <coughs> 1 minus e squared I refer to as some b squared I refer to as some b squared so when I do that then the standard equation of the ellipse whose major axis coincides with the x axis is x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared is 1 where b squared is going to be a squared into 1 minus e squared is the standard equation of an ellipse. x square by a square plus y square by b square equal to 1 is the standard equation of an ellipse clear now <coughs> can I wipe this off right now let me trace the ellipse let me geometrically trace it okay One thing for sure, since e is a number lying between 0 and 1, 1 minus e squared would lie between 0 and 1. So for this choice, b must be b squared must be less than a squared, b must be less than a. Isn't it? Because 1 minus e squared would be less than 1. So b squared would be less than a squared and b would be less than a. Clear? that's what you you'll understand why why I suggested be less than a because when I'm going to now trace this entity the importance will emerge hmm? so I now want to be able to trace this x square by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1 hmm. one thing for sure <coughs> y squared by b squared is 1 minus x squared by a squared but this is non-negative so this would also be non-negative so this would always be greater than or equal to 0 for all x, y on the ellipse, for all points on the ellipse, this would be greater than or equal to 0. That means x square by a squared for all x, y on the ellipse must be less than or equal to 1 or for all x, y on the ellipse, x square must be less than or equal to a squared or that means mod x must be less than or equal to a. That means for all x, y on the ellipse, for any point x, y on the ellipse, x must be less than or equal to a, greater than or equal to minus a. That means the limits of the ellipse are x equal to minus a to plus a as we had witnessed earlier. This is only in support of what we saw and understood earlier, right? So the ellipse must lie between minus a to plus a. These are the horizontal limits of the ellipse, right? <coughs> Similarly, from this very equation, I could have said x square by a square is 
1 minus y squared by b squared right but this is non negative so so must this be this must also be non negative so this is greater than or equal to 0 this would again produce y squared less than or equal to b squared or y must be less than or equal to b greater than or equal to minus b that means these are critical limits for any point on the ellipse the entire limit ellipse must lie between y equal to minus b to y equal to plus b right so now i know the confinement of the ellipse right that's the first thing you would want to know if you want to trace a curve clear so these were the coordinate axes the rightmost extremity being a0 this is the center the origin the leftmost extremity being a prime minus a0 the ellipse cannot lie no part of the ellipse will lie to the right of a or to the left of a prime right similarly no part of the ellipse would lie above 0 comma b right above y equal to b this is 0 b this is the point capital b no part of the ellipse will lie below b prime which is 0 comma minus b no part of the ellipse would be less than minus b right so these are the vertical limit ellipse right not only that <coughs> see <coughs> if x comma y be a point on the ellipse if x comma y satisfies this equation right then x comma minus y will also satisfy this equation isn't it if x comma y satisfies this equation then replace y by minus y then x comma minus y will also satisfy this equation P and Q are mirror images about the x-axis, isn't it? Because see, if x comma y be a point here, then x comma minus y will be a point here. Yes or no? That means the way the curve is above the x-axis, the curve would be identical below the x-axis. That means the curve is symmetric about the x-axis. The way you would perceive the curve above the x-axis, the curve would look identical below the x-axis, meaning therefore the curve is symmetric about the x-axis. Yes or no? Right? So this would imply No, this time when I am talking of the x-axis, I am actually meaning the major axis. I have given it a name, the x-axis. But I actually mean the major axis, right? It's going to be symmetric about the major axis. The major axis, since it's synonymous with the x-axis, I'm choosing to call it the x-axis, right? But symmetric about the major axis, physically symmetric about the major axis. Is it about the minor axis yeah, I'll see that. We'll, that's exactly what I was. So curve symmetric about the major axis. In this case, it's the x-axis. If it was some other line, if the major axis was some other line, 3x plus 4y plus 1 equal to 0, then it would be symmetric about that line, right? So in any case, symmetric about x-axis for this description. For this description, it's symmetric about x-axis, right? Also, realize that if p x comma y be a point, then q prime minus x comma y will also satisfy this equation. Now if p is this point, then q prime would be this point minus x comma y would be this point and p and q prime are mirror images about the y axis, right? Therefore, the way the curve would look to the right of the y axis, it would be mirrored about the y axis to the right of the y axis it would get mirrored to the left of the y axis that means it's symmetric about the y axis right so it's symmetric also about the y axis it's symmetric about y axis makes sense right now 
Is that okay or not okay? Right? Very clearly, let me look at that part of the curve which lies in the first quadrant. The part of this curve that lies in the first quadrant. Means x greater than 0, y greater than 0. 0 comma b satisfies this equation. So, it is a point on the curve. Right? a comma 0 satisfies this equation. This is also a point on the curve. Right? Very clearly, as x increases, y will decrease here in the first quadrant. If x is increasing, y must decrease. Therefore, if you go from x equal to 0 to x equal to a, y must decrease. As x increases, y decreases. If you go from x equal to 0, which is the origin to x equal to a, as x increases, y must decrease. So, this must be the looks of the curve. This must be the looks of the curve in the first quadrant, yes or no? But the curve is symmetric about the x-axis. Therefore, you can mirror image it about the x-axis. You can mirror image it about the x-axis, which means hmm? how? Yeah, but then you know that's the shape of the curve. I'll tell you why it cannot be inwards. The x-axis is not a tangent to the curve. If it would have got inwards, it would have looked like the tangent. The x-axis would have become a tangent. That's not the case. <coughs> I'll tell you what he's saying and I'll give you a quick one on that as well. Since it's symmetric about the x-axis, therefore, you can mirror it about the x-axis. If 0 comma b is a point, then 0 comma minus b is also a point. So, this is 0 comma minus b. Is this point b prime? Right? So, this is the look of the curve to the right of the y-axis, but the curve is symmetric about the y-axis. So, you will have a mirror image of this to the left of the y-axis, right? It is symmetric about the y-axis. Therefore, what you would see on the curve is a mirror image of the same. This would give me a prime. Sorry, it is a little ugly, but you know, this is how the curve would look. So, if I had to just draw a better curve, now that I understand how it is going to be, I would make it smoother. This is how it is. B, B prime. This is 0 B. This is 0 minus B. This is A, A 0. This is A prime minus A 0. Right now, <laughs> this is the maximum vertical span of the ellipse, and this length BB prime is called the minor axis. This length BB prime is called the minor axis. AA prime was the major axis, BB prime is the minor axis, and the curve is symmetric both about the major as well as the minor, minor axis. axis. is of length 2b and this is referred to as the minor axis. B is called the semi minor axis, small a is called the semi major axis, B is the semi minor axis and small a is the semi major axis and the relationship between the semi minor and the semi major axis is b squared is a squared into 1 minus e squared, where e is the eccentricity of the ellipse, e is the eccentricity of the ellipse. Yes or no? In fact, e squared then turns out to be 1 minus b squared by a squared, right? One thing, b is less than a. Now, if you keep decreasing b, if you keep decreasing b, what would happen to the eccentricity? 
it will come closer and closer to 1 right if b tends to 0 it will come closer and closer to 1 right if b is increased what's the maximum to which it could be increased a b cannot be larger than a and then when b comes closer and closer to a e comes closer and closer to 0 and this will become like a circle the circle will then be a special case of this an extreme limit of this when b equal to a when the semi major and semi minor axis become equal the ellipse is the ellipse then becomes a circle the ellipse then becomes a circle right now <coughs> if e increases that means when b decreases when B decreases, E increases, yes or no? Hmm? Hmm? <coughs> that means this would this length would become thinner, this length would become thinner, right? When the eccentricity increases from 0 to 1, this length would become thinner, right? So then let's say for E equal to 0, you have a goal matol healthy ellipse, which is a circle. B equal to A. E equal to 0, right? We are, we run E from 0 to 1. E equal to 0 will be like B equal to A and this would be like a healthy circle, right? Now, so this is E equal to 0, right? Now E is increased. Now we increase E. So as we keep increasing E by decreasing B, by decreasing B, this will be, this portion will become slender. So then, this is how it will be, and then, this is how it will be. It'll so, this is like increasing E, increasing E, decreasing B. This is how the shape will turn, right? So, a motor ellipse in this sense will be like smaller values of E. If you migrate into these regimes, the value of E increases, the value of E increases as B decreases, this length decreases, right? No, this, this, this would eventually, I'll tell you, uh, as B tends to 0, B tends to 0, uh, this would eventually, what would really happen is, it would just culminate and up like this. It would just culminate. This is not really an extreme case when B is A. See, there is a fundamental difference between ellipse and a parabola. An ellipse will have a center. Whereas, see, that's the reason ellipse is more intimate to a circle and is not intimate to uh, a parabola, right? So, it doesn't culminate into a parabola, but it cul culminates into a circle because the parabola doesn't have a center. Fundamentally, ellipse, hyperbola, and circle, they are central conics, they have centers. Parabola is a little odd man out, it does not have a center. That is the way it goes. Hmm? Huh? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. Dude, not at all. Certainly not. Okay, what he's saying is, I'm so sorry, but hardly true. What he's saying is, this is a parabola. Right? This is a parabola. Listen to me, man. This is its directrix. Huh. He says, draw an identical parabola like this. It will become an ellipse. Is that what you're saying? अरे गुरु इसका यहाँ एंड थोड़ी है इसका किस एंड से बनाएगा ये तो चला जाता है आसमान में ये पाताल में कहाँ से बनाएगा बता कहाँ पे हाँ यहाँ पे पहले बना दिया लाइन हाँ अच्छा ठीक है इसको बना दिया मतलब काट छाट दिया पैराबोला की जान मार दी है ना फिर बोल रहा है इसको इसको मिरर इमेज बना दे not at all, yaar. think of it. Why would this be an ellipse? Any point on this satisfies, if this is y, this is x, then y squared is 4ax. Is y squared equal to 4ax any? Certainly not, okay?
I I can't forget this fellow. Um, he he gave us a lot of entertainment in the class, unadulterated joy, and he for a long time believed till the almost till the end of class twelve believed the following. He said, if this is a sine curve. This part of the sine curve is a downward opening parabola. This part of the sine curve is an upward opening parabola. No, first of all, he asked me this question, sir. This part of a parabola, uh, this part of a sine curve, whether it's a circle or a parabola, whether it's a circle or a parabola. Okay, so he left me petrified for a while because end of class 12, someone coming up with this. Is very dangerous, and then he said, "Okay, forget all, all that. Tell me whether this is a parabola or a circle." I said, "It's neither a parabola nor a circle. It's an, it's a sine curve. It's a different curve. Huh? But the parabola also looks like this." <laughs> and then you know, I had very special words for him, so I had to hold the class for a few minutes. Took him aside because those words were not for public consumption. But in any case, Guru, I said, "Dikta is ka matlab usko jod dega idhar se udhar se to wo ellipse nahi ban jayega." ठीक है? अभी clear है ना? शाबाश, चलो. ठीक है, end of class twelve तक नहीं wait करना पड़ा इसके लिए. Very good. I'm impressed. Now, see what then transpires is. The look of this curve I'll answer your question also. I'll just take notice of that because <coughs> this was the ellipse with these two being the vertices a zero and minus zero. Zero B minus B major axis, minor axis, semi major axis, semi minor axis, right? <coughs> This is the origin of coordinates, also the center of the conic section. Center of the conic section. Now the focus turned out to be S A E zero, and the directrix. Turned out to be x equal to a by e. It's directrix, right? Isn't it? But if you really think about it, I would have got, I would have got the same look, the same look, if I had a focus symmetric like this, s prime, which is minus a e zero, and a directrix. Which would be x equal to minus a by e. Then also, I would have got the same looks of the ellipse. Yes. I would have got the same looks of the ellipse. Yes or no? That means this ellipse could have been obtained with this focus and this directrix, or could have been obtained with this focus and this directrix, right? So in that sense, we say that well, this ellipse has two foci and two directrices. Has two foci and two directrices. This focus communicates with this directrix. This focus communicates with this directrix. Yes or no? You know what I'm saying? Yes. Put a equal to b in everything that I have done. E equal to zero and a equal to b. You will understand what the focus and what the directrix is. Right. <coughs> See, if E becomes zero, the focus will coincide with O, the center, isn't it? If E is zero, x equal to a by E would be a line at infinity, right? <coughs> no, that's a special case. When B becomes a, then E is zero, isn't it? <coughs> so, 
हाँ सॉरी यू वॉन्ट टू मेक दर एक्सेस दी माइनर एक्सेस नो बट वाई द बिगर वन विल ऑलवेज बी द मेजर एक्सेस आई टेल यू योर क्वेश्चन इज कुड दिस हैव बीन the minor axis and this the major axis yes if that was the case then the ellipse will look like this if a was bigger than b if a was bigger than b then a square and b squared the relationship you know that we had here b squared is a squared into 1 minus e squared the relationship then would become a squared is b squared into 1 minus e squared a would then be less than b this would be a0 this would be 0a minus a0 0b 0 comma minus b so b becomes bigger than a and this would become the major axis this would become the minor axis yeah why not if b was bigger than a then the equation will still be the same yes x equal to y equal to b by e and y equal to minus b by e will be the directrix right hmm no yes 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 the minor axis the the axis of the parabola is always a line passing through the focus and perpendicular to the directrix right that's the major axis and the axis of the parabola so major axis is actually synonymous with the axis the major axis is synonymous with the axis so far so good right yes. now <coughs> see if there is any point p x y on the ellipse if there is any point x y on the ellipse then sp would be e times pm for any point xy on the ellipse sp would be e times pm sp is the focal distance of the point p distance of the point p from this focus sp is the distance of the point p from this focus sp is e times pm right which is e times pm what is pm a by e minus x pm is a by e minus x which is a minus e x right that's distance from this focus if you want to find distance from this focus then just replace e by minus e you'll get the distance from this focus how see this is s prime minus a e 0 right i want s prime p right now if i take distance from this focus then i'll have to take distance from this directrix right this is p m prime so can i say s prime p would be e times p m prime s prime p would be e times p m prime clear hmm? what is p m prime p m prime this length is x this length is a by e that means distance from this focus is going to be a plus ex so distance of xy from this focus is a minus ex this is a minus ex and distance from this focus is going to be a plus ex and you could have obtained this from this by replacing e by minus e So a plus e x and a minus e x, right? Now, no, I just want to two directrices in the sense that you know the the same curve could have been obtained from this focus directrix and this focus and this directrix. So uh, see, this is another way of looking at the ellipse. But in early times. you know when when they were talking of uh, when astronomers were evaluating ellipses in terms of planetary motion the way the ellipse was defined is what i'm going to come to uh, in a little while from now right uh, see for any point on the ellipse p sp plus sp prime 
S prime P. Sum of its distances from the two foci is A plus EX and A minus EX, which is 2A, which is the major axis of the ellipse, right? Which is true for all XY, which is true for all XY. That means, in fact, this was the basic definition of the ellipse uh, as given by astronomers, right? If a point P moves in a manner that sum of its distances from two fixed points is a constant, then the path traced by that point is an ellipse. And this distance would be referred to as the major axis. This would be the definition of the ellipse, the, mo the earliest known definition of the ellipse. This is how the ellipse was defined, right? <coughs> right? So this is also a property of the ellipse, now known to you as a property, but was once upon a time the definition of the ellipse. If a point P moves in a manner that sum of its distances from two fixed points is a constant, then the path traced by that point would be the the path traced by that point would be an ellipse. And this length would be referred to as a property, the major axis of the ellipse. Right? Does it make sense? Hmm? In fact, you know, if you had an arrangement, you had a thread connected to the point P, there was some kind of a rod here, and there was a thread that joined this to S, this to S prime, the one single thread. The thread length will not change, and now if you move that rod, then the tip of the rod will tra trace an ellipse, because no matter how you move it, it's this distance plus this distance will always be the length of the thread, right? And the path traced by the point P then would be an ellipse, right? <coughs> now, <coughs> few things. From now on, like we've always been doing, the ellipse is x square by a squared, standard equation of the ellipse, x square by a squared plus y squared by b squared minus 1 is 0 is the standard equation of an ellipse, right? This expression from now on would be referred to as s. s is x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared minus 1 is the expression s. S equal to 0 represents a collection of points x, y that lie on an ellipse. On an ellipse. No, I do that too. Don't worry. That lie on an ellipse. S equal to 0 will represent an ellipse, but S is only this expression, right? So, S equal to 0 will be an ellipse. S equal to 0 will be an ellipse. S will just be this expression, right? Now, if there is a point P, that point P could be inside the ellipse, outside the ellipse, or on the ellipse, right? And just like we handled this earlier, if S1 is defined as X1 squared by A squared plus Y1 squared by B squared minus 1, if that's S1, right? S1, if it turns out to be 0, that means this is the value of S, at x equal to x1 and y equal to y1. And if s1 turns out to be 0, x1, y1 must be a point on the ellipse. If So this is x1, y1 on the ellipse. s equal to 0 is the ellipse. If s1 is greater than 0, then x1, y1 would be a point outside the ellipse. Outside the ellipse, s equal to 0. If s1 is less than 0, then x1, y1 would be a point inside the ellipse, s equal to 0. So this gives me, like it did in circles and then in parabolas, the position of a point with respect to an ellipse inside, on, or outside. Can I wipe this off? Hmm? <coughs> now, 
now we would go ahead and figure out a parametric representation of points on an ellipse in a parabola y squared equal to 4ax the parametric representation of different points was x equal to 80 squared and y equal to 280 was a parametric representation of different points on a parabola standard parabola now we are going to figure out the parametric representation of different points on an ellipse right so if this is an ellipse call it x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1 b squared is a squared into 1 minus e squared b is the semi minor axis a is the semi major axis e is the eccentricity a number floating between 0 and 1 there is a center c of this conic section in fact the center of any conic section has a special property the property is that any chord passing through the center must be bisected at the center any for all central conics for all central conics for all central conics in this case let's say the center is 0 0 and if this is a chord PQ passing through the conic section passing through the center of the conic section see this will be the midpoint of x y and minus x minus y it would be the midpoint of x y and minus x minus y isn't it that means any chord passing through the center must be bisected at the center any chord passing through the center must be bisected at the center any chord drawn passing through the center must be bisected at the center that's a property of the central conic that's the meaning of the center of the conic that's the meaning of the center of the conic and a chord that passes through the center is also called a diameter is also called a diameter a chord that passes through the center pq in this case will also be referred to as a diameter in circles all diameters are of equal length but in a para in a in an ellipse the diameters are not of equal length right now <coughs> so this was the conic x square by a square plus y square by b square equal to 1 <coughs> the center C for the standard ellipse is 0 0 major axis 2 a semi major axis a this is one vertex a 0 this is another vertex minus a 0 of the major axis right now I draw a circle whose center is the same as the center of the ellipse and is of radius a this is a circle a circle drawn with center c and radius equal to the semi major axis radius which is the same as the semi major axis as the semi major axis radius of the circle right center c which is 0 0 in this case and radius equal to the semi major axis a then the equation of the circle is going to be x square plus y squared equal to a squared isn't it the equation of the circle x minus 0 whole squared plus y minus 0 whole squared is square of the radius a a squared right that's so. this circle from now on would be referred to as an auxiliary circle auxiliary circle right now <coughs> if I take any point on the ellipse P right any point on the ellipse P then let's say if, if a point is taken on this part of the ellipse then it would get mapped to a certain point Q on 
this part of the circle. If a point is taken here, it would get mapped here to a point on the circle here. If a point is taken here, it would get mapped to a certain point here. If a point is taken here, it would get mapped to a certain point on the circle here. Yes or no? Right? So every point on the ellipse, we choose to map to a unique point on this auxiliary circle. There would be a one-to-one -one correspondence between points on the ellipse and points on the circle, right? Now, <coughs> the center of the circle is C, right? CQ would be the circle. For every Q, there would be a unique P. For every P, there would be a unique Now, this Q could be uniquely located with the help of this angle theta. <coughs> this Q could be located with the help of this theta. So, this theta would uniquely locate Q and therefore would uniquely locate P. Therefore, for every P, there is going to be a unique theta. And that theta can have any value lying between 0 and 2 pi. For with every P, we can associate a theta, yes or no? With every P, we can associate a Q, right? And with that Q, I can associate a unique theta. That means this theta can be associated with P, yes or no? This theta is actually the polar angle of Q, but it is not the polar angle of P. This theta is called even though it is the polar angle of the point on the circle, it is called the eccentric angle of P. This theta is referred to as the eccentric angle of P. Of P. For every point on the circle, for example, if this is the point and I want to know the theta for this point, then what would I do? I would map it here, I would join C to this point and then this would be my theta, this would be my theta, yes or no? So if this was P, then the corresponding point on the circle would be Q here and Q I join to the center of the circle and then the corresponding theta would be this, this. So for every P, there would be a unique theta obtained from corresponding points on the circle, yes or no? And that point that that angle theta is called the eccentric angle of the point P, right? So for every point on the ellipse, I can find a unique eccentric angle lying between 0 and 2 pi, right? Right? Now, A is the radius of the circle. A is the radius of the circle. So, this would be A cos theta, the x coordinate of P. x coordinate of Q, I am sorry, x coordinate of Q and therefore also the x coordinate of P will be A cos theta. Yes or no? Right? So, Q would have x coordinate, CQ is the radius of the circle A. So, x coordinate of Q would be A cos theta. And that will also be the x coordinate of P, right? Because they are, on the, they are on the same vertical, right? So P has x coordinate which is A cos theta. P has x coordinate which is A cos theta. Now, <coughs> the y coordinate of Q would be this A sin theta, isn't it? I want to figure out the y coordinate of P. I want to figure out the y coordinate of P. Now, this is a point on this ellipse. So, this must satisfy the equation of the ellipse. Yes or no? This must satisfy the equation of the ellipse. That means I can put x equal to a cos theta and y equal to yp. So, if I put x equal to a cos theta here, then I have a cos theta whole squared by a squared.
प्लस वाई पी स्क्वेड बाय बी स्क्वेड इक्वल टू वन देन दिस वुड गिव मी वेरी क्लियरली वाई पी इज बी साइन थीटा दिस विल गिव मी वाई पी एस बी साइन थीटा राइट सो इफ थीटा इज द एक्सेंट्रिक एंगल ऑफ दिस पॉइंट पी देन the x coordinate of that point would be a cos theta y coordinate of that point would be b sin theta would be the y coordinate of that hmm? no 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 it will not include all points if i constructed a circle with minor axis then those points no <coughs> because it's most convenient because it's most convenient you want to make it complicated you can have complicated parametric forms but why do you want to complicate matters there right no if i switch b and a that means if the circle is vertical then the auxiliary circle will become x square plus y square equal to b square The auxiliary circle is drawn with the major axis the diameter, right? <coughs> Therefore, if theta is the eccentric angle of any point on the ellipse, then the corresponding x and y coordinates of that point would be a cos theta and b sin theta would be the x and y coordinates of that point, right? <coughs> and how do you obtain theta? If this is a point, how do you obtain theta? you can't up, you can't join c to p and say that's theta no you would find the corresponding point on the auxiliary circle then join the center of the circle to that point q and find the angle that it makes with the major axis that will be the eccentric angle of point p the polar angle of q will be the eccentric angle of p the polar angle of q would be the eccentric angle of p yes or no are you all okay with this so if this was an ellipse say x square by a square plus y square by b square equal to 1 and if there was a point p with eccentric angle alpha the, if the eccentric angle of this point p was alpha and there was another point q and if the eccentric angle of the point q is beta then what would be the coordinate p a cos alpha b sin alpha what would be the coordinates of q a cos beta b sin beta would be the coordinates of q so now you have two points whose x and y coordinates you know right this would be a chord that joins points with eccentric angles alpha and beta pq is a chord joining two points with eccentric angles alpha and beta right the equation of pq you can find using coordinates of these two points that will finally turn out to be turns out to be <coughs> x cos alpha plus beta by 2 by a plus y by b sin alpha plus beta by 2 equal to cos alpha minus beta by 2 would be the equation of the chord joining two points with eccentric angles alpha and beta right now you can you can y minus b sin alpha by x minus a cos alpha is b sin alpha minus b sin beta by a cos alpha minus a cos beta you can find the equation of the chord pq right i'm just giving you the final form without wasting time on doing that right now suppose 
this was a chord joining two points with eccentric angle alpha alpha and beta this was a chord that means a second joining two points with eccentric angles alpha and beta and the equation of the chord pq would be this right now suppose q comes closer and closer to p suppose q comes closer and closer to p that means beta will come closer and closer to alpha and pq will become a tangent at p pq becomes a tangent at p yes or no pq then becomes a tangent at p right if q is brought closer and closer to p then what transpires is the following this is p the limiting case of this chord would be a tangent at p this happens when beta is brought closer and closer to alpha when beta is brought closer and closer to alpha what you get is a tangent at p right so in this equation if i put beta equal to alpha will i not get the equation of the tangent at a point whose eccentric angle is alpha yes, sir. yes or no yes. if i put beta equal to alpha in this equation then the chord would be rendered a tangent at alpha if i put beta equal to alpha then this chord would be rendered a tangent at alpha right which means equation of a, of tangent at p tangent at p obtained by putting beta equal to alpha in this will be x by a cos alpha plus y by b sin alpha equal to 1 is the equation of the tangent at a point whose eccentric angle is alpha right this is the equation of the tangent at a point whose eccentric angle is alpha hmm sorry perpendicular form but what good will it do I mean, one by A is capital A, one by B is capital B. That way you say, yeah. But there is no connect between the two. <coughs> Which means, if this is a point P, whose eccentric ang angle is alpha, then the x coordinate of this point, say x and y coordinates of this point are x1, y1. Then x1 would be A cos alpha, and y1 would be B sin alpha. Right? So then, if I want to, this was the equation of the tangent in terms of the eccentric angle alpha, right? This was the equation of the tangent in terms of the eccentric angle alpha. If I want to find the equation of the tangent in terms of x1, y1, then what I do is I say x1 is a cos alpha, y1 is b sin alpha. Replace cos alpha by x1 by a. Replace sin alpha by y1 by b. Cos alpha by x1 by a. Sin alpha by y1 by b. Then the equation of the tangent at x1, y1. x1 y1 cos alpha by x1 by a sin alpha by y1 by b it will become x x1 by a squared plus y y1 by b squared equal to 1 is the equation of the tangent at alpha yes or no a at x1 y1 all that has been done is the x square has been replaced by x x1 y squared has been replaced by y y1 right this becomes the equation of the tangent at x1 y1 yeah. yes slope of this tangent as you can see slope of the tangent as you can see y is slope is minus b squared by a squared into x1 by y1 is the slope of the tangent at x1 y1 slope of the tangent at x1 y1 isn't it slope of this line <coughs> hmm? in fact from now on 
we would refer to this expression t as xx1 by a squared plus yy1 by b squared minus 1. It's just this expression. This minus 1 is just this expression t. If x1, y1 is a point on the ellipse, then t equal to 0 will represent the equation of the tangent at x1, y1. If x1, y1 be a point on the ellipse, then t equal to 0 will represent the equation of the tangent at x1, y1. In fact, in a very general sense, suppose this is the conic x square by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1. And if this is any line y equal to mx plus c, if this is any line y equal to mx plus c, right, then this line could intersect the conic in two real and distinct points, p and q, real and distinct. it will be a chord or this line could intersect the ellipse at two coincident real points, coincident real points P and Q are coincident or In this case, P and Q are imaginary. Now, how do you find the intersection of this with the line y equal to mx plus c? If I solve this equation and this equation, then I get the common points of intersection if they exist, right? So, if I, if I have to solve this curve with this line, that means points of intersection between the ellipse and y equal to mx plus c, then I would solve the simultaneous equation, right? That means on solving x square by a squared plus y, y I replace by mx plus c, that is the common point of intersection, whole squared by b squared equal to 1. It will give me a quadratic in x. And the two values of x that I obtained would be x of p and x of q. The two values of x that I obtained from this would be x of p and x of q. Now, if x of p is equal to x of q, it will be a tangent. If x of p is equal to x of q and real, it will be a tangent. This will be x of p not equal to x of q. It will be a second or a chord intersecting the ellipse at real and distinct points. This would be x p x q imaginary. Yes or no? Is not it? Hmm? x p and x q are the roots of this quadratic. This quadratic I could have written as something into x squared plus something into x plus something equal to 0 is how I could have written this quadratic. Right? If it gives me two coincident real roots, it, if it gives me two coincident real roots, then this is the case. It will give me tangency. It will give me tangency case where discriminant is equal to 0 for this quadratic. This is the case where discriminant is greater than 0 for the quadratic. This is the case where discriminant is less than 0 for the quadratic. Now, if you if you uh, obtain the discriminant of this quadratic, let me just give you the final result because again, no point wasting time there. Let me just uh, tell you discriminant equal to 0 will give me c squared is a squared m squared plus b squared right discriminant less than 0 will give me <coughs> c squared greater than a squared m squared plus b squared that means if in this line c squared is greater than a squared m squared plus b squared then I will get this case the line will not intersect the curve at real points if c squared is greater than a squared m squared plus b squared. You can also imagine that. See, if I keep increasing c, then maintaining m, then either it will go up this way, if I numerically increase c, or it will go this way. That means it will belong to this positioning of the chord pq, right? So, c squared greater than a squared m squared plus b squared, 
no real points of intersection between the line y equal to mx plus c and the ellipse and discriminant greater than 0 will give me c squared less than a squared m squared plus b squared 2 will give me this case so based on how c is we would either have the chord becoming a tangent or the chord intersecting the ellipse at real points or the chord intersecting the ellipse at imaginary points yes or no which means that if y equal to mx plus c is a tangent to x square by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1 then we must have c squared equal to a squared m squared plus b squared that means c could be plus minus root a squared m squared plus b squared that means y equal to mx plus c c could be plus minus root a squared m squared plus b squared will a line of this form will always be a tangent to the ellipse x square by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1 if i keep varying m i get different tangents to the ellipse tangents with different slopes right in fact let me tell you that if this is y equal to mx plus root a squared m squared plus b squared a tangent at a point p and if this is the center then there would be another tangent to the ellipse that will be parallel to this tangent and that tangent would be at the ends these two tangents would be ends of a diameter these two tangents would be ends of a diameter this tangent would be y equal to mx minus root a squared m squared plus b squared these would be tangents at the extremities of a diameter they are parallel tangents tangents drawn at the extremities of a diameter are parallel to each other they have the same slope In fact, in a very general sense, we will use this y equal to mx plus root a squared m squared plus b squared as family of tangents. Because I can keep varying m and I get all possible tangents to the ellipse. Family of tangents. We will just take a 5 minute break and start up. Right, uh, <coughs> again coming back to the standard ellipse x square by a square plus y square by b square equal to 1. <coughs> and I told you any tangent to the ellipse is of the form y equal to mx plus root a squared m squared plus b squared where m could be looked upon as a parameter different values of m will give you different tangents right now <coughs> suppose this is a tangent then the equation of the tangent must be this right suppose this tangent passes through a point p say h comma k this tangent passes through a point p h comma k ok then h comma k must satisfy this equation right this is a tangent of slope m right so k equal to m h plus root a squared m squared plus b squared Now if I solve for m, what would I get? If I solve for m, I would get the slope of the tangent drawn from hk to the ellipse. If I solve for m, what would I get? I would get the slope of the tangent drawn from hk to the ellipse. Yes or no? Right. 
सो के माइनस एम एच होल स्क्वेर इन माई अटेम्प टू सॉल्व फॉर एम वुड बी ए स्क्वेर एम स्क्वेर प्लस बी स्क्वेर वुड बी ए स्क्वेर एम स्क्वेर प्लस बी स्क्वेर राइट एच स्क्वेर माइनस ए स्क्वेर इंटू एम स्क्वेर माइनस टू के एच इंटू एम प्लस के स्क्वेर माइनस बी स्क्वेर इक्वल टू जीरो क्वाड्रेटिक एन एम मीनिंग वॉट In general, two tangents could be drawn from a point H K to the ellipse because two slopes. That means one tangent would be this, the other tangent this. One of slope M one, the other of slope M two from a point H K to the ellipse, where M one and M two would be the roots of this equation. M one M two would be the roots of this equation, right? right <coughs> now now <coughs> for some condition for some hk the two tangents would be perpendicular to each other for some hk for some points p the two tangents drawn from those p's would cause would cause the tangents to be perpendicular some hk's would cause the two tangents drawn from them to be perpendicular to each other then those p's are said to lie on the director circle all those p's from where the tangents are perpendicular to each other are referred to as points on the director circle so locus of p such that tangents from p to the ellipse are perpendicular is called the director circle is called the director circle no in case of a parabola it was a straight line but we'll figure out if it's a circle or not it'll turn out to be a circle but even if it is not i can still call it a circle every curve is a circle in my opinion right right okay so now if p is a point on the director circle then m1 and m2 must be minus 1 right so if p is on the director circle if it's on the director circle then M one, M two must be minus one. Product of the roots of this equation must be minus one. M one, M two is what? K squared minus B squared by H squared minus A squared is minus one, right? Which means H squared plus K squared is A squared plus B squared. A is the semi-major axis, B is the semi-minor axis. So now the locus of P is readily available to me. I generalize this to get the locus of P. Replace H by X and K by Y to get the locus of P. Right? Generalize. Replace H by X and K by Y. That gives me X square plus Y squared is A square plus B squared. And do you realize that this? is a circle whose center is the same as the center of the ellipse this is a circle whose center is the same as the center of the ellipse right and therefore it's concentric with the auxiliary circle also it's concentric with the auxiliary circle but bigger than the auxiliary circle the auxiliary circle had radius a the radius of this is root a square plus b squared right so concentric with the auxiliary circle and it has radius root a square plus b square is the radius of this any point on the circle from any point on the circle if you draw two tangents then those two tangents would be perpendicular to each other this circle is called the director circle this is the director circle its radius is root a square plus 
B square. So far, so good. Hmm? Now, let me just state two more things. First of all, this is an ellipse S, which is defined as x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared minus 1. It's just the expression S. S equal to 0 will be the ellipse, right? If there is a point P, x1, y1, outside the ellipse, then a pair of tangents could be drawn PA, PB are two tangents that could be drawn in general from any point on the ellipse, right? Uh, from any point outside the ellipse, two real tangents could be drawn to the ellipse. From any point outside the ellipse, a pair of real tangents could be drawn. If A and B are points of tangency, then AB is called the chord of contact with respect to P. AB is called the chord of contact with respect to P. And do you remember how we obtained the chord of contact? T equal to 0. T equal to 0. The equation of the chord of contact is T equal to 0 and T we have defined as xx1 by a squared plus yy1 by b squared minus 1. That 0 is the equation of the chord of contact with respect to an external point. Hmm. <coughs> Again, if this is a chord PQ and if the midpoint of this chord is x1, y1, if m is the midpoint of this chord, then the equation of the chord in terms of its midpoint is given by t equal to s1. Is t equal to s1. t means xx1 by a squared plus yy1 by b squared minus 1. What's s1? x1 squared by a squared plus y1 squared by b squared minus 1 equal to s1 would be the equation of the chord in terms of its midpoint. That was the result we read in circles and then in parabola, now in ellipse and then it'll, it's going to be true in hyperbola, right? So I'm not going to repeat it again. So See, if this is an ellipse, x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared minus 1 equal to 0. This is an ellipse, x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared minus 1 is 0. And this is a family of parallel chords, each of slope m. And now, <coughs> let's say capital M is the variable midpoint. I take the midpoint of this chord, I take the midpoint of this chord, I take the midpoint of this chord, midpoint of this chord, midpoint of this chord, and I join the midpoints of the system of parallel chords. Then I'll figure we will we'll figure out that the line joining the midpoints of a system of parallel chords will pass through the center of the ellipse and therefore would be a diameter. We will figure out that on joining the midpoints of a system of parallel chords, 
I get a line that passes through the center of the conic section and therefore would be deemed a diameter, would be deemed a diameter. Let us check that out. Say this is a system of parallel chords and this is one sample chord PQ, one sample chord PQ whose midpoint M is X1, Y1, whose midpoint M is X1, Y1. This M is variable. We will have different X1, Y1s for different M's, for different chords we will have different X1, Y1. So to get the locus of M, what would I do? I would connect X1, Y1 and then generalize, replace X1 by X and Y1 by Y. Y1 by Y to get the locus of the midpoints M, right? Okay. So equation of PQ in terms of M, equation of PQ in terms of its midpoint M is going to be given by T equal to S1, equation of the chord PQ in terms of its variable chord PQ in terms of its midpoint M. So T equal to S X S1 means XX1 by A squared plus YY1 by B squared minus 1 is x1 squared by a squared plus y1 squared by b squared minus 1 is the equation of the chord in terms of its midpoint right now no matter what x1 y1 b the slope of this line will always be m S these are all chords having slope m so the slope of any of these pqs no matter what their midpoint m x1 y1 b the slope would be x1 y1 uh, would be small m, I am so sorry, would be small m, right. So small m, the slope of this variable called pq, variable y because pq could be this, pq could be this, pq could be this, m could be the midpoint of this or the midpoint of this or the midpoint of this, any one of these, right. m would be the slope of this which is what, minus b squared by a squared into x1 by y1 is the slope of this line, can you see that, hmm? which is true for any one of these x1 y1s which is true for any one of these x1, y1s, the midpoints of these variable pqs, right? m is a constant, same for all x1, y1. So then, this is the relationship between the midpoint, x coordinate of the midpoint with its y coordinate for any pq, right? So on generalizing this, I will get the locus of m, on generalizing this, I will get the locus of the midpoints of this system of parallel chords. Generalizing means, I would replace x1 by x and y1 by y. So when I do that, m would be minus b squared by a squared into x by y, which would give me y equal to minus b squared by a squared m into x, which is the locus of the midpoints of a system of parallel chords, which is a straight line passing through the origin and therefore the center of the conic. It will therefore be a diameter, isn't it? Is it not a line passing through 0, 0? Therefore, the center of the conic, therefore, must be a diameter. Y equal to minus B squared by A squared M into X. And what kind of a diameter is it? This is a diameter. This is a diameter. This is what I get. This is the diameter. Whose equation is Y equal to minus B squared by A squared M into X, which clearly passes through the center of the conic, which clearly passes through the center 0, 0 of the conic, right. <coughs> and this diameter, this diameter bisects all chords of slope m. This diameter bisects all chords of slope m, yes or no? Yes, yes, it will be symmetry. <coughs> Bisecting all chords of slope M. This bisects all chords of slope M. Hmm? What? No, it will, see, not, not, ra this would not be the mirror image of this. No, it will not be the mirror image of this. Area will be the same but it will not be the mirror image, you are right. Absolutely. Or the minor axis. Hmm? Then it will be the mirror image, exactly the mirror image. Right? Yes or no? Hmm? Uh, 
So, this is a diameter. Why? Because it passes through the center. And this diameter bisects all chords of slope m, right? Which means <coughs> these are chords of slope m, these are all chords of slope m, and the diameter you can have very many diameters, but this is a unique diameter which bisects all the chords of a given slope m. minus b squared by a squared m is a diameter that bisects all chords of slope m, right? What is the slope of this diameter m prime? The slope of this diameter is minus b squared by a squared m. Which is the slope of the diameter? Bisecting all chords of slope m. Yes or no? Yes, slope of a diameter bisecting all chords of slope m. Now, <coughs> suppose Suppose I had chords parallel to this diameter, that means chords having slope m prime. These are chords with slope m prime. These are chords of slope m prime. These are chords of slope m prime. Again, there would be a diameter bisecting all chords of slope m prime. There would be a diameter bisecting all chords of slope m prime. Yes or no? Yes, right? This is a diameter bisecting all chords of slope m prime. Now, the, the way to find the slope of the diameter given the slope of the chords is minus b squared by a squared into m prime, which is where m is the slope of the chords. Now, the slope of the chords is m prime. So, the slope of the diameter would be minus b squared by a squared m prime. Yes or no? The slope of the diameter would be minus b squared by a squared m prime. Yes or no? Hey, but minus b squared by a squared m prime is actually m? m. But minus b squared by a squared m prime is actually m, yes or no? Yes, sir. So this is m? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Which means, please listen to me, which means that if I have chord chords of slope m, then a diameter of slope m prime will bisect all the chords right if i if i have chords of slope m prime then a diameter of slope m will bisect all chords of slope m prime yes or no now m and m prime are two special numbers satisfying this condition what condition m m prime would be minus b squared by a squared there is this diameter of slope m prime and there is this diameter of slope m, right? What, right? This is a diameter of slope m prime. This is a diameter of slope m. And what property do these special diameters enjoy? Product of their slopes is minus b squared by a squared. This diameter of slope m prime bisects all chords of slope m this diameter of slope m bisects all chords of slope m prime. That means each diameter 
bisects chords parallel to the other diameter this diameter bisects all chords parallel to this diameter and this diameter bisects all chords that are parallel to this diameter these are two special diameters bisecting chords parallel to the other diameter and if they do so the property that they enjoy is that the product of the slopes must be minus b squared by a squared what i mean is if this is a diameter of slope m prime and if this is a diameter of slope m if this is a diameter of slope m prime and this is a diameter of slope m obviously they intersect at the center because both pass through the center of the ellipse and if the product of the slopes is minus b squared by a squared and if the product of the slopes is minus b squared by a squared then this diameter will bisect all chords parallel to this diameter this diameter will bisect all chords parallel to this diameter that's the property that they enjoy and if i have a pair of diameters enjoying this property then these diameters are referred to as conjugate diameters then these diameters enjoying this property and therefore this physical or geometrical property then these diameters are referred to as conjugate diameters <coughs> what are conjugate diameters a pair of diameters that bisects chord that by each one of them bisecting chords parallel to the other diameter this is what is meant by conjugate diameters and the algebraic relationship that will guarantee this to happen product of the slopes must be minus b squared by a squared then they would be conjugate diameters if i if i if i take any two diameters and if i find that the product of the slopes is minus b squared by a squared then i can be rest assured that each will bisect chords parallel to the other one are you okay with this or not okay hmm no no infinite number of uh, such diameters exist i can select one value of m prime and the corresponding value of m another value of m prime just the product of the slopes must be minus b squared is can i have will i not have infinity of m and m primes such that their product is minus b squared by a squared isn't it ha huh. for a given m m prime is unique if i have one diameter then its conjugate diameter is unique if i have one diameter then its conjugate would be unique have you all understood this so if i have two conjugate diameters product of slopes must be minus b squared by a squared each diameter will then bisect chords parallel to the other diameter right confused now <sighs> suppose this is a pair of conjugate diameters then the product of their slopes must be minus b squared by a squared each must bisect chords parallel to the other diameter right suppose this one is of slope m and say this one is of slope m prime and say the ellipse is x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared equal to 1 hmm <coughs> suppose these points are p q r s are these points the center of the conic is the origin hmm? suppose <coughs> the eccentric angle of this is theta 1 and say the eccentric angle of this is theta 2 right then what would be the coordinates of p a cos theta 1 b sin theta 1 A cos theta two, B sine theta two. Now, m prime will be the slope of this diameter. 
this point has coordinates this and c is 0 0 what is m prime therefore m prime would be y2 minus 0 divided by x2 minus 0 isn't it that will be m prime so the slope of this diameter m prime would be y of this minus y of this divided by x of this minus x of this so that makes it b sin theta 1 divided by a cos theta 1 that's m prime right what is m m would be y of this minus 0 divided by x of this minus 0 will be the slope m of this y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1 so that makes it b sin theta 2 minus 0 divided by a cos theta 2 minus 0 that is m now if they have to be conjugate diameters then m m prime must be minus b squared by a squared if they have to be conjugate diameters minus b squared by a squared this into this as you can see is b squared by a squared sin theta 1 into sin theta 2 divided by cos theta 1 into cos theta 2 is minus b squared by a squared right so that makes it cos theta 1 cos theta 2 plus sin theta 1 sin theta 2 is 0 which causes cos theta 1 minus theta 2 to be 0 or let me write this because I the way I have drawn theta 2 is bigger than theta 1 so theta 2 minus theta 1 is 0 that means theta 2 minus theta 1 must be pi by 2 yes or no that means if these are two conjugate diameters and if the eccentric angle of this is theta then the eccentric angle of this will be theta plus pi by 2 so if this is theta then the eccentric angle of this will be theta plus pi by 2 it does it mean that this is 90 degrees no 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 not at all see it means that the see these are polar angles of corresponding points of the auxiliary circle then the radii drawn at polar theta 1 the radii radius drawn at polar theta 2 those two radii would be perpendicular that's why these this will not be perpendicular because these are eccentric angles of p and q these are not polar angles of p and q are you confused no no so this is not 90 degrees the corresponding radii for the corresponding points of p and q on the auxiliary circle those radii would be perpendicular to each other got me hmm? then 1 plus tan theta 1 tan theta 2 would be 0 that means tan of theta 1 minus theta 2 would be undefined therefore theta 1 minus theta 2 is 90 degrees it does not make a difference is not it is that okay or not okay okay so what would be the now if this and this differ by 90 degrees this and this must also differ by 90 degrees therefore if this is theta plus pi by 2 this must be theta plus pi add another pi by 2 and this and this must also differ by 90 degrees so if this is theta plus pi this must be theta plus 3 pi by 2 does it make sense hmm? these are eccentric angles of these points is that okay hmm? huh? except when they are major and minor axis but there it is the product of the slopes is not minus b squared by a squared no they are not perpendicular so they are not perpendicular they are not perpendicular because see the ra corresponding radii if they are perpendicular then these cannot be perpendicular is not it if the corresponding radii are perpendicular then this cannot be perpendicular to this so conjugate diameters cannot be perpendicular
But if I go by the base as a special case, if I go with the basic definition, that means each chord bisecting chords parallel to the uh, other diameter, then the major and minor axis enjoy this property. All chords parallel to the major axis will be bisected by the minor axis and vice versa. But the product of the slopes is not minus b squared by a squared. So that's only a special case. Hmm. No, 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 no. See again, in this case, the corresponding points are here, isn't it? And then this will be less than that 90 degrees. This will be less than 90 degrees, right? So that's not. Okay, so now. <coughs> huh? Yeah, but, but they satisfy the geometrical property that each one will bisect chords parallel to the other one. But the reason we don't have product of the slopes is minus b squared by a squared is because the minor axis has a slope which is undefined. That's why. That's why we can't apply that. Isn't it? So far so good, right? <laughs> you have an exam tomorrow? Newtown, I know, I know. Oh, all of you. Okay, thank you so much for coming despite your exams. I'll tell you, uh, people who can do that regularly, coming to my class, no matter what exam you have tomorrow, I can guarantee you will do good. Thanks for coming. I will not hold you back longer than this. Uh, but you know, we've got started with basics of Phillips. We have a host of exciting stuff uh, waiting to be done in Ellipse. In, in physics, next class, we'll do problem solving on wave mechanics. Okay? Huh? Rotational mechanics.